Matthew chapter 10, we'll be looking at the first seven verses of Matthew 10 as we continue journeying through the first gospel of the New Testament, the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 10, we'll begin in verse 1. I'll ask you to follow along with me as I read. And he called to him his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and every affliction. The names of the 12 apostles are these. First, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, excuse me, Simon and Andrew, yes, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. These 12 Jesus sent out, instructing them, go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel and proclaim as you go, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. I saw recently some film clips from the International Town Crier Competition. There is an International Town Crier Competition. You know the old town crier? There's a number of national ones throughout Europe and there's an interna international one. And basically, you ought to look this up on YouTube. It's, it's awesome. I want nothing more in life, Ronnie, than to enter the town crier comp competition. It's basically old white men dressed in the outfits from four or five hundred years ago, and they've they've got a big bell, and they they're dressed the part, and they stand on a stoop, and they say, "Hear ye, hear ye!" And each of them has a proclamation, and they try to word their proclamation with the wording of a royal announcement from the time. And there's an audience there and they're, they're grading these guys and they perform the function of a town crier. They're graded on uh, the volume, tone, inflection of their voice, the difficulty of the words they have to announce and whether or not they do it with clarity and energy. Town criers, I love it. The Wikipedia page says in medieval England, Town criers were the chief means of news communication with the townspeople, since many were illiterate in a period before the movable type was invented. Royal proclamations, local bylaws, market days, adverts, even selling loaves of sugar were all proclaimed by a bellman or crier throughout the centuries. At Christmas, 1798, the Chester Canal Company sold some sugar damaged in their packet boat, and this was to be advertised by the bellman. It lists other historical examples, and then it ends with this. Town criers were protected by law as they sometimes brought bad news, such as tax increases. Anything done by the town crier was done in the name of the ruling monarch. And harming a town crier was considered to be treason. The phrase, don't shoot the messenger, was a real command related to the town criers. So town criers were the official mouthpieces and spokespeople of the king or the ruling authority of the land. And they were sent out to announce royal decrees and news. And I can't help but think, when I think about a town crier, of the church. The church is the kingdom's town crier. We are sent to stand in the towns, cities, villages, wherever, everywhere, and proclaim, hear ye, hear ye, good news. There are lots of terms that the New Testament uses to describe us. We are an army of God. We are the body of Christ. Paul says we are ambassadors. But I'd like to suggest that we're also town criers. In our text, Jesus sends the disciples out like criers. He tells them to go to all the towns 
and announce the good news of the kingdom. So I, what I want to do tonight is I want to evaluate the, the efforts of these first disciples as town criers for the kingdom of God. First thing I want to do is talk a little bit about the 12, God's use of common folk for uncommon impact. Look again at the list. He called to him his 12 disciples, and then he gives the list. This is Matthew's list of the 12 disciples. Craig, what do these 12 names mean etymologically? Simon actually comes from the Hebrew for hearing, but the Greek form of Simon, Peter, or Cephas in Aramaic, Kephas, is rock, as we all know. But in Hebrew, Simon is the word hearing. Andrew comes from the Greek word for manliness, manliness. James comes from the Hebrew Jacob, which means he who grasps the heel. That sound familiar to you? John in Hebrew means the Lord is gracious. Philip comes from the Greek, that's a Greek name, for horse lover. Philip means horse lover, lover of horses. Bartholomew comes from the Hebrew for son of Talma. Thomas stems from the Hebrew for twin. Matthew comes from the same Hebrew phrase as Nathaniel, which means God has given. James, son of Alphaeus, is also called Homikros in Mark 15, 14, or James the Younger. That's to distinguish him in age or size, the smaller or the younger, from James the son of Zebedee. Thaddeus is also called Labaius in some textual variants, and Judas, son of James, in Luke 6. These names get a little complicated. Simon, Ho Kenanoi, the Cananean, the Zealot, his nickname meant the Zealous One. And Judas Iscariot, who, by the way, is always mentioned last in the gospel lists of disciples. Iscariot may mean the man of Kerioth, or it could mean the assassin. There was a militant group of zealots at the time called the Sakari, the men of the dagger. And they were thought to be Jewish men who would slip up behind Roman soldiers who were not paying close attention and they would shiv them with daggers. And so it could be that Iscariot is a slight variation of Sakari, which would mean that Judas was part of a hyper-nationalistic revolutionary group of guerrilla warfare people who tried to kill Roman soldiers with daggers. What I want you to notice about this list is Jesus calls all types of people, but also he calls common people. These men are common men. And we know that because in Acts 4, the crowds will marvel at the uncommon impact of these common men. In Acts 4.13 we read, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated, common men, they were astonished. And they recognized that they had been with Jesus. Think about this. Jesus doesn't call the mighty the powerful, the wealthy, the strong. He does that too. He calls all people. But to call his disciples, he called common people. Uneducated and common. But those two phrases in Acts 4.13 are important. They were seen to be uneducated and common, but they were also seen to have been with Jesus. Which means this. In the kingdom of God, there are no common people. Jesus can take anyone and do something amazing in and through your life, lives. That's why snobbery is unacceptable in the body of Christ. This is why James says in James chapter 2 that you should not show partiality. That if you have a church function 
and a rich, well-dressed person shows up and you seat that person in a seat of honor and then a poor person in rags shows up and you seat them in the back corner, you've shown partiality. The church as a reflection of the kingdom, the kingdom is bigger than the church, but the church is part of the kingdom, should celebrate all people who come to Jesus regardless of social standing. Paul will also rebuke, rebuke the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians when he says, I hear tell that when you come together, it's to eat and drink and feast while others are neglected, right? So these Lord's Supper celebrations and love feasts and, and at, at that time in history, they seemed to be a wider meal meal and at the end of which you would have the Lord's Supper. They were becoming occasions to make people who had less aware of the fact that they had less. But Jesus calls common people. I, I wanna say this because the church sometimes inadvertently privileges and prizes those who have it all together. I think sometimes, I hope our church doesn't. If we do, I will tell you it is inadvertent. We don't knowingly do this. But maybe without even knowing it, sometimes we communicate to people, well, you have less or you know less or, or you know, this guy has a PhD and you didn't get out of high school and this kind of stuff. And we can, we can be judges of persons without remembering that the Christian movement began with common people. It was a grassroots populist movement of the kingdom because Jesus, I believe, wanted to demonstrate his power in working through people whom the world would have rejected. Paul says the same thing in 1 Corinthians chapter one, by the way, when he says, look at yourselves. It's one of the more humorous chapters. I've always thought it would have been awkward to be the first audience to hear this. But in 1 Corinthians one, Paul says, look at yourselves. Not many of you are wise or wealthy or powerful or good looking or have real good hygiene or anything. He's, you know, I've made those last couple too, but he, he's listing all these things He's like, but God used you. I was like, I th I've always thought that the original audience would have thought, well, I mean, thank, thank you. But God uses common people for uncommon purposes. He uses me, uses you, uses all of us, common people all. And we should thank God for that. Howard Foshey tells the following story. Years ago, I read a newspaper feature written by a man who told of his student days in New York City. He related how he used to visit the magnificent cathedral of St. John the Divine. Once a guide called his attention to a series of niches around the cathedral chancel. Niches, niches, I go with niches. In each niche was carved the figure of a man who had been chosen as the greatest of his century. The first century was represented by St. Paul, Columbus represented the 15th, Washington the 18th. The 19th was awarded to Lincoln. It was the last niche that really caught his attention. The block of unshaped stone had not yet been carved, still in rough hewn form, it represented the greatest man of the 20th century. That name was yet to be chosen, for that person could well be in the process of becoming. I say that to say this, don't forget that God can do great things through you. And in the kingdom of God, we all have our own niche. God takes all of us and makes us useful for his kingdom. We may not be people celebrated by the world, but we are celebrated in the kingdom because that's how God works. God seems to love taking the riffraff and changing the world. He seems to want to take common people and do uncommon things. Secondly, I want you to think about the disciples in this way. The apostles, the called, are the sent. If you're not, if you read this quickly, you'll miss the fact that in Matthew 10, verses 1 and 2, two different words are used to describe these 12 men. Did you catch it? In verse 1, they are called disciples. In verse two, they are called apostles. This is, I believe, the only time Matthew will use that word in reference to these men. They are apostles in verse two. What is the difference? 
Craig Blomberg writes, the New Testament scholar, only here does Matthew label the 12 apostles, those sent out on a mission. Apostle is a word that has a connotation of going. But what I want to point out to you is that the, the men who are called are the ones who are sent. To be a disciple of Jesus is to be sent. The details of their sending help us understand what the word apostle meant. Look back at verse 5. These 12 Jesus sent out instructing them, go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel and proclaim as you go, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So let's deal first of all with the fact that Jesus tells them not to go to the Gentiles. Go nowhere among the Gentiles, enter no town of the Samaritans. Well, what does this mean? Well, let's get at the meaning, meaning through the process of elimination. First of all, we can eliminate any notion that Jesus did not care about Gentiles because he's already shown care and amazing mercy and forgiveness to Gentiles even in the first nine chapters of Matthew. He's done it on a number of occasions. And we've seen Matthew in the way he even writes the gospel highlights Jesus' universal love for all people. So that's not what's happening here. What's happening here is, what's, is what we'll refer to as the priority of Israel. Remember, first of all, that Jesus was the fulfillment of all of the promises made to the great patriarchs that we've been studying about on Sunday morning in Genesis. So all of those promises made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the covenant made with David, the Noahic covenant, the, the Adamic covenant, the covenant made with Adam even, all of the promises of God found their fulfillment in Jesus so first and foremost, Jesus came to the house of Israel to demonstrate that he is the fulfillment, that everything they were looking for had found its culmination in him. That's why he chooses 12 men and not 11 or 13. The disciples are representatives of the 12 tribes of Israel. It is as if he is saying the hope of all of the tribes of Israel, the hope of Israel itself is now found in the message that I am bequeathing to the disciples. This is the hope you were promised. This is what Abraham was looking for. Abraham rejoiced to see my day, Jesus will say. So it doesn't mean he didn't care. It also doesn't mean that salvation is only for Israel. There's a book in the Old Testament that destroys that notion. The notion of radical Jewish exclusivism was destroyed in the book of Jonah. That's the point of Jonah. Remember, go to Nineveh, the Gentiles who hate you. Jonah doesn't want to. God makes him go. He has his ways. And Jonah repents and Jonah, Jonah preaches and Nineveh repents and then Jonah pouts and then God kills a plant. That's the book of Jonah. But the point of the book of Jonah is that salvation goes beyond Israel. The, the way to look at this is to say this, God's love for the nations has never changed. God loves the Gentiles, but the desired plan for the gospel to get to us was through Israel, right? Israel was supposed to be the vehicle through which God accomplishes his great work. So knowing that, you can now understand even some of Jesus's behavior that might make you uncomfortable. For instance, in Mark 7, do you remember Jesus and the Syrophoenician woman? And from there, verse 24, Mark 7, he arose and went away to the region of Tyre and Sidon, and he entered a house and did not want anyone to know. Yet he could not be hidden, but immediately a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him and came and fell down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile, a Syrophoenician by birth. And she begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. Then he, Jesus said to her, let the children be fed first, for it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. <laughs> but she answered him, yes, Lord, yet even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. And he said to her, for this statement, you may go your way. The demon has left your daughter. And she went home and found the child lying in bed and the demon gone. This isn't the time to unpack all of this, but I just want you to know the principle at work. 
the priority of Israel, but the ultimate goal of the Gentiles hearing the good news through Israel's faithfulness. He does heal the Syrophoenician woman's daughter. Now, if you want to ask what's he doing calling her a dog, you'll have to go back because I preached on that like five or six years ago. Because I talked about how North Little Rock was called Dogtown back in the day, Argenta. Uh, the Syrophoenicia was called Dogtown to the Jews. It was a kind of a play on words of how she was viewed. But anyway, probably the most crystal clear expression of the priority of Jewish evangelism but the ultimate hope of the salvation of the world was said by Paul in Romans 1, I am not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And we know from the book of Acts that whenever Paul went into a new city, where did he go first? The synagogues. But notice for our purposes here that the, the men who are called are also sent. And while there are some differences between this missionary sending and our sending, I want to acknowledge that. We are under the great commission to go to everyone. I don't deny there are some distinctions here. Jesus sends these specific disciples out in this first missionary journey exclusively to Jews in that region. Our ministry is to the whole world, but Jesus will very quickly move to the whole world, even in the Gospel of Matthew. While there are differences, I do think that there is an important principle established here, and that means Jesus sends his disciples. Every one of us have a responsibility, as God gives us opportunity, opportunities that we should be looking for, to be salt and light and speak good news to people who need it. This is Matthew 10, but 18 chapters later in Matthew 28, Jesus will say, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I'm with you always to the end of the age. So that is the sentness of Jesus' followers. And thirdly, what is the message that we have? Jesus uses common people. Jesus sends those whom he calls. And thirdly, the message is the kingdom. The kingdom is the message then and now. Look at what Jesus tells them to preach. These 12 Jesus sent out, instructing them, go nowhere among the Gentiles or enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel and proclaim as you go, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, I'm going to do something I'm real uncomfortable doing at this point. And I'm afraid Dale Prater is going to be mad at me because Dale loves Warren Wiersbe, and I love Warren Wiersbe too, Dale. I want to say that. So before you throw something at me, I'm a big fan of Warren Wiersbe. I mean that. I quote him frequently. I love Warren Wiersbe. But for the life of me, I disagree with his take on this. I agree with him. I'm going to share with you what he says. I agree with Warren Wiersbe that the church cannot look at Matthew 10, 1 through 7 and do exactly what it says or else we would only go to Jewish people. I, I, as I just said, I don't disagree with that. This is a specific thing, but my point is in principle it applies. What I disagree with him is what he says about that message, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And I'm not even sure I would disagree with, I probably just disagree with the way he's reading this. But here's what Warren Wiersbe writes, who I otherwise really love. Have I mentioned this that I really love? Yeah. Warren Wiersbe says this, and we can discuss it in the, uh, we can discuss it in the question and answer time afterwards. While we may learn from the spiritual principles of this paragraph, he's talking about the first verses of Matthew 10, we should not apply these instructions to our lives. The Lord's commission to us includes all the world, Matthew 28, I don't disagree. And not just the nation of Israel, I don't disagree with that. Here's my problem. We preach the gospel of the grace of God. Our message is Christ died for our sins, which obviously I agree with, 
not the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The king has come. He has already suffered, died, and risen from the dead. Now he offers his salvation to all who believe in him. And I just want to say this. I just want to say that in my opinion, the, the proclamation of the kingdom is the proclamation of Jesus' dying and rising again. Because to proclaim the kingdom is to proclaim the king who comes to bring us into the kingdom. Now, in Wearsby's defense, I would imagine he would say that the gospel we now preach is somewhat different because we're not saying Jesus has now come in an incarnate state. We're saying Jesus has laid down his life. I just think it's a dangerous way of putting it. The gospel of the kingdom includes the good news about what the king did to bring us into the kingdom. And one of my main problems with what Wearsby says here is that all through the New Testament, I believe even in the teaching to Gentiles, you see the apostles continuing to preach the kingdom in relation to salvation. So for instance, in Romans 14, 17, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. So that means that the life of the kingdom is the life of the church. The church should now see ourselves as citizens of the kingdom. But then in Colossians 1, listen to this. In Colossians 1, verse 13, Paul writes, he has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sin. So, and again, I don't think, I think if Wearsby could speak from the grave, he'd say, yeah, I don't disagree with that. I think he was tying the kingdom in that reference to the first advent of Jesus in his incarnate state. And I'm trying to say that the kingdom of God includes the gospel. The gospel is the gospel of the kingdom. We should tell people that the king has come and the king is coming again. And through his death and resurrection, the door of the kingdom is open and we can now live as kingdom citizens. It's not a different message. It's maybe a different shade of it given the time we're in. But we must tell people about the king and his kingdom because the apostles did. Do a word search on BibleGateway.com of the phrase, inherit the kingdom. It is all through the New Testament. Enter the kingdom. It is all through the New Testament. My point is the post Ascension Church continued to preach to everyone the kingdom because it contains the gospel. Now, we can, I'll let y'all tell me why I'm wrong in just a minute, but let me just conclude by saying this. It is a powerful thing to think that the kingdom of God is the one kingdom that will never end. All other kingdoms will end. I like saying this because I don't think we Americans really believe it. And I like trying to say things that agitate people. There will be a day if the Lord tarries when America will not exist in its current form. School kids go to Rome and pay $5 to look at the rocks of the Roman Empire and they are bored. Little seventh grade kids in Rome, it's just rocks. But there was a time that was the pinnacle of creation. I mean, that was the great empire. Here's how R.G. Lee put it. Saddened we are to think of how Babylon, glorious and great, became a vermin-infested, animal-prowling jungle. I love R.G. Lee. He used to preach at Bellevue back in the day. They all know R.G. Lee. Preached the most fam one of the most famous Southern Baptist sermons ever called Payday Sunday. Payday Sunday. Sobered we are when we think that ancient Rome with her close meshed code of laws and her victorious legions became a branchless tree, dishonorable, fruitless. Regret assails our minds when we think of how ancient Greece with all her art and philosophy and athletic prowess and philosophers became a molded crust in history's garbage can. Saddened we are when we read history's book, history's book and learn how ancient Egypt 
with all her wealth and wonders, became a shabby sexton of splendid tombs. And we are awed into fear and trembling for other nations of our world today when we remember ancient Spain with her piratical ships that harassed all seas and filled the nation's coffers with gold, felt the hand of God's retributive providence and became a lousy, drowsy beggar watching a broken clock. People don't talk like that anymore. Every great kingdom has fallen, but the kingdom of Jesus never, ever will. Get close to preaching on a Wednesday night. And that's why I say, no, you keep saying the kingdom of God is at hand. Because for a lost person, it is coming. And for a saved person, it is coming. George Eldon Ladd once said that the kingdom of God is the already not yet kingdom. It's here, but it's not yet here. It came with Jesus, but it's still coming in fullness.